The speaker is uh, Alex Kikun from UC Riverside. Uh, he's going to show us uh, a really a radical new kind of uh, spintronics processor based on uh, spin waves and uh, holographic uh, interactions, which I think is uh, fascinating. And uh, Eli, you better have a question for Alex at the end. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Alexander Kitun. And today I would like to present to you Magnonic Holographic Coprocessor, an approach to an energy efficient complementary logic circuitry. This book was supported by the Fame Center, one of the six centers of StarNet sponsored by MARPA and DARPA. In my talk, I would like to make an introduction and ex explain the principle of operation of magnonic holographic coprocessor. Is it better? And then I would like to present to you experimental data. Fortunately, we have experimental data to show how we can do pattern recognition and parallel database search using this device. And I will conclude with estimates on how much energy we can save using this device. So the general concept is shown here. This device receives input information like any other electronic device. Information is coded into the voltage. Then we convert this information into the spin waves. And we compute inside this device using spin waves, where logic 0 and 1 correspond to the two phases, like 0 and pi over 2. So in this matrix, we have spin waves propagating from one side to another. Here we have a grid of waveguides connected into the cross junction. For each cross junction, we have this memory element, which has two or several thermally stable states. And when spin wave, sorry, when spin wave propagates under this magnet, it accumulates certain phase shift and amplitude change depending on the position of this orientation of this magnet. So on the other side, we have interference produced by the interference spin waves, and we detect the inductive voltage produced by the spin waves. This voltage has maxima if spin waves are coming in phase, and minima if spin waves are coming out of phase. And this in phase or out of phase depends on the input phases and how we arrange magnets inside, inside our matrix. Here you can see photo and schematics of our prototype device. It's built on from YIG material. YIG material, yttrium iron garnet, has very low damping for spin waves. And because of that, we can see spin waves at room temperature and distances up to one centimeter. And the length of this device is uh, three millimeter. And we can easily see spin waves propagating in these materials. Then we have four junctions, and we put four magnets on the top of each junction. At the edge of each waveguide, we put a micro antenna which we can use in order to excite spin waves and also in order to detect the inductive voltage. The goal of our experiment was to show that indeed we have correlation between the phases at the input and voltage at the output. And most importantly, we wanted to show that we can control this correlation by arranging magnets inside this matrix. So in our experiments, we use six antennas in order to simultaneously excite six spin waves. Then we use just one antenna to detect the inductive voltage produced by the spin wave superposition. <laughs> for free antennas, we kept phase constant. For other free antennas, we use phase shifters in order to change independently phases for the input spin waves. And here you can see experimental data. So what you can see here is these color plots with uh, color markers. On X, Y, Z scale, we have phases. That's the phases we apply to our antennas. And the color of this marker it shows what is the inductive voltage we detected at the end. For example, we take this marker, we see phase 1, 0 0.2, phase 2, 0 0.2, phase 3, 0, and then we have this, we have this blue <coughs> marker. We see at the scale, it corresponds to the 2 millivolt output. And then we repeated these experiments for different uh, matrices with different configuration of magnets. So you can see this experimental data for matrix without magnets. If we have magnets uh, oriented in this direction, we have this correlation. If we change just one magnet, we have change in the correlation at the output for the same phase combination. Then how we can use this <coughs> correlation between the phases and the output in order to do, for example, pattern recognition. We can consider these phase combinations is a kind of uh, number. 
In this experiment, we use for each antenna 10 distinct phases, which we can easily correspond to some number. So instead of combination of three phases, we can say we apply some number, for example, 223. Then we measure some output of this device. We have analog output, uh, but we don't need to recognize all the states. Uh, we just in introduce some reference voltage, for example, 0 0.6 millivolt, and say if we have output higher than 0 0.6 millivolt, this pattern is recognized. If you have below than 0, 0 0.6 millivolt, we don't recognize this pattern. So this device works as follows. We have some number in the input, and it tells us, do we have this number in our memory, or we don't have? It may be number, it may be some image, uh, any other pattern. And what is good that <coughs> it takes 100 nanoseconds for spin waves to propagate and construct this interference pattern. So in our experiments, we checked all 1,000 combinations, phase combinations, which corresponds to the numbers from 0 to 999. If we use all seven antennas to excite spin waves and one antenna to detect, it means that we can check all numbers from 1 to 10 to the power 7. And it takes the same 100 nanoseconds because everything works in parallel and the propagation time is the same whatever we use, three antennas or six. Then it may be even more interesting how we can use this device for parallel database search. It is known, I would like to cite this paper by Seth Lloyd, saying that we can do quantum search without entanglement. Meaning that in quantum computers, computers we have quantum superpos uh, state superposition and entanglement. However, if you use classical waves and we use just superposition without entanglement, we may have significant advantage over conventional digital computers in some specific uh, problems, for example, in database search. So here is a theory, and I would like to show you experimental data, how it works. In our device, we code information 0 and 1 to the two phases, let's say 0 and pi over 2. So it's very essential for us to prepare a superposition of two waves, which is a wave with a phase pi over 4. And what does it mean that, <coughs> for example, if you, if you need to identify what is the maximum voltage we can get for some combination, we can make it one by one. We can check all possible combinations and see what is the maximum voltage. Or we can apply superposition of states and in one step estimate what is the maximum output of this device. And here you can see experimental data. Here experimental data measured voltage at different phase combinations where we use zero phase uh, for zero logic, 0 0.4 pi for one, and we did this parallel search using a superposition of waves for each input. Well, we checked three matrices and it really works with our device. Why it's so important that we can extend this approach for a multi-dimensional phase space and we, and we can look for some patterns in specific part of the phase space. And practically, we can only imagine, for example, if you have a large database, for example, credit cards. And we have this device which helps us to search with this database. We can code logic, uh, I mean, credit card number into the phases of the spin waves and relate the output voltage to, for example, amount charged to this credit card. Then suppose we have to search through this database and we have to find out if any of these credit cards was charged more than 10K last month. And the problem is that we don't know all the numbers. Some numbers are missing. For digital type processor, it will take enormous of computation in order to take one by one all credit card numbers. With our device using superposition, we can make it in just one computation. Then, coming to the estimates on energy consumption. The most important part in our device, energy consuming part, is that these antennas generating spin waves. And what we have right now in our experiments, we use just 12 to 15 microwatts per antenna in order to generate spin wave signal. It's a really low power. Here you can see estimates from our most recent work, sorry, in collaboration with Dmitry Nikonov. 
stating how much energy we will need for scalable devices. For scalable device, devices, it should be even better because we need less time for spin waves to propagate and construct an interference pattern. So by estimate for 32 working antennas, we will need just 72 femtojoules in order to make one computation. And the main question is here, how many operations can be done with these 32 antennas? Or more importantly, how much energy it would need for general type processor in order to do the same job. And here you can see estimates, CMOS, and this holographic processor doing different uh, type of computation. Uh, one advantage comes from the fact that we have built-in memory. And we save a lot of uh, energy just because we don't have to transfer data from outside inside this holographic processor. Then if you use just this processor for relatively simple tasks, we have some advantage. If you use this processor for parallel database search, then we may have fundamental advantage. And advantage is bigger for bigger databases because we have more efficient algorithms for searching. <coughs> I would like to skip this summary slide because I don't have much time. I just want to conclude with this statement that the idea of this holographic coprocessor, it can't work alone. It still needs guidance in order, he, he needs to know where to search. But when it comes to searching, then it may be very efficient and save us a lot of energy. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, do we have any questions? Um, I'll start. Um, I'm not sure I s followed uh, in your analysis of the uh, energy requirements each, uh, each time you want to change the search, you have to reprogram those uh, permanent magnets that are in each uh, node in the, in the array, correct? No, no, it's not correct. For example, we have this large database for credit cards. Yeah. And we have, it's written in this inside holographic processor. Yeah. So we apply credit card number, code it in the phases. It gives you output in millivolts how much it's charged. And then when we search in this database, we don't change anything inside this uh, database. We don't reprogram it. We don't change our position of our magnets. We only change phases at the input. That's it. What determines the state of the magnets that you program at those uh, intersections? OK, when we construct this uh, uh, database, huge database, we want to make a correlation between the number and the amount charged. Yeah. So we take this number, its phase combination, and then we arrange our magnets such a way so at the output we have voltage corresponding to the amount charged to this credit So card. when do you have to change the configuration of those magnets? When oh. you choose which numbers you're searching for? No, no. Only at the beginning when you construct this database. I see. OK, uh, yeah. Oh, let's give you a, a microphone here. So the follow-on question is, how do you figure out how to configure those magnets? You know. Yeah. Actually, it's a very challenging question, how to <laughs> configure and how to create this correlation that's for exactly for certain combination of phases to have output. And I personally, I tried, but I, I don't know this recipe how to. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker one more time.